Hi everyone, it's Dusty Joe again on this uh, Wednesday evening. Uh, nice weather outside, not too hot, not too cold, uh, but it's all good. I uh, hope everyone's having a, a wonderful January so far, uh, 11 days in, and hopefully you are hitting all your resolutions that we discussed for the last couple of weeks. And I've got mine down pat, I've got a lot to do this year, and uh, so I'm looking forward to it. The market's slow, slow in. Uh, spoke to a real estate agent today, and uh, so it looks like uh, this is good news. Uh, well, you know, it's kind of counterintuitive. Uh, when the market's slow, uh, obviously a lot of people are, are worried. Um, you know, I know, if, if, I know if I was a real estate agent or if I was a mortgage broker or anyone in that sort of uh, vertical line for real estate deals, uh, it's slow, which means that uh, you know, business is uh not that great but if you are looking to buy uh this may be a good time in fact it is a good time um as i said if you take a long-term view uh slowdowns usually bring a lot of opportunities a lot of opportunities that come out in this chaos that's taking place and uh and hopefully uh people that are listening to this live stream uh if you take a long-term view of real estate you probably appreciate what i'm talking about so Definitely, it's a good time to get back into the market if you're not already in. Uh, definitely a good time to get your finances in order so that you can take advantage of some of the buying opportunities that's going to occur uh, in the next few months or weeks or years or however long this uh, plays out. Anyway, uh, so what we're going to talk about today are some of the top real estate mistakes uh, that, uh, you know, that I've made and also which I think are common to a lot of uh, real estate investors whether it be you new, whether you're intermediate, or whether you're a seasoned investor. You know, we all make mistakes. I've made a lot of mistakes, and I kind of um, went through my uh, my diary and, uh, and kind of looked at some of the mistakes I've made. I wanted to share some of that with you today. So uh, the title of today are, is the, uh, the top mistake real estate investors make. And uh, so, again, towards the end, we're going to have the usual uh q a so if you got some questions you want to pose to me uh please put them in the chat and i will try to uh get to uh your questions uh you know towards the end of today's live stream okay so let's uh again kudos to alvin amber and uh everybody else that uh, uh have recently completed or doing deals uh you know and so on so uh kudos to you guys uh i saw a really nice email from um from, uh, Alvin today, uh, you know, giving kudos to some of the folks down at uh, the Housing Authority and people that are assisted in his deal. So congratulations to him. And uh, looking forward to working with you, Amber, on your journey on this deal. Okay, so let's get going. Becoming a real estate in, um, you know, investor is not easy. You know, as easy as it seems, you know. In fact, um, you know, it's easy to make mistakes, um, especially if you don't know. Because sometimes what you, what you don't know, you don't know. Uh, I'm, you know, you know, you know, my experience, I didn't know what I was doing when I first got into real estate and, uh, you know, the saying ignorance is bliss. I don't think so. Um, uh, ignorance is not bliss. If you don't know what to do, especially if you put a lot of money on the line, it could be very stressful. It could be quite traumatic and, um, uh, it can set you back. So if you're considering investing in real estate, you must do your homework and strive. I'm sorry, strive to adequately prepare yourself um you know for what uh real estate investing actually requires you know while infomercials will tell you invest you know real estate investing is easy uh make some fast buck all you gotta do is buy my course or attend this boot camp or or go to this class it's as simple as abc uh i recall uh one infomercial guy you know he was saying that if you buy his course uh it's as easy as one two three get in get out and get paid that's it <laughs> it's as simple as that just get in get out get paid that's that's his uh mantra for make, for making big bucks in real estate you know we all know it's not as easy as that uh it can be very challenging and there's really no guarantee that uh, you're you know you, in fact you don't actually make any money in fact uh if you're reckless you could uh you know you could well just as well lose money especially also if you um if you get in at the wrong time or if you have the wrong strategy for whatever that uh 
the market cycle you're in. So many unseasoned real estate investors will lose a lot of money. And, uh, and that is why you need to plan very carefully and consult with the right people, especially if you're, if you don't have the experience, um, you know, uh, or if you're new into this thing or you don't have a whole lot of money to kind of quote unquote waste. So whether you're planning on flipping a house, uh, becoming a rental owner, or just interested in learning more about real estate investing, what we're going to do today is talk about some of the common mistakes that I've made that, uh, many people have made, and hopefully I can help you avoid. Uh, making what I call uh, unnecessary mistakes. Let's just get to it. Uh, number first one is not planning carefully, not planning carefully. You know, you know, we all don't have a lot of money, uh, especially money to waste. And so when you're in a financial, you know, when you, whether you're in a good or okay financial position, you know, uh, it's important that uh, you plan appropriately don't just jump into it um uh, you know proper you know in my opinion proper planning proceeds the purchase uh not the other way around i, I recall a couple of people have called me after they purchased a home and say hey dr i just bought this house at 123 main street now what do i do you know um you know it's kind of it should be the other way around i would think you may want to kind of say, okay, then I want to buy this house for this reason. And this is the strategy I want to implement. And, uh, and because of my strategy, this is the reason why I bought this house. Okay. You know what you want to do, uh, before you bought it, as opposed to buying it and then figuring out, you know, how to make it work. So hurrying into a home purchase can lead to problems down the road. This was a really, I think a case in point, uh, you know, six months, a year ago during the heyday, the seller's market, when every house, every, you know, deal that was multiple offers and therefore you had to move fast. <clears throat> if you didn't move fast, you could have lost the deal. Uh, if you had quote unquote contingencies, you weren't going to, you know, your offer was probably going to get rejected. Uh, a lot of people waived financing contingencies. They waived appraisal contingencies they have waived uh inspection contingencies you know because uh they had to move fast you know now things are kind of slowing so you can have a little breather and therefore you can move in uh i think with your eyes open as opposed to crossing your fingers and hoping for the best so buying mistakes happen a lot a lot uh during buyer's market i know there's a lot of people who bought at the peak of the market who are now for a second guessing themselves, why did they do that? They overpaid, uh, you know, they bought houses that they probably shouldn't have bought in locations that they probably regret in conditions that uh, in hindsight, they probably shouldn't have done it, but they had to do what they had to do to get into a house. So, you know, it's, it is what it is, but moving quickly uh, can sometimes uh, set you back later on. So, um, don't get caught up in a hoopla and uh, plan carefully before you pull the trigger and, 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 and make, uh, you know, make offers and things like that. I mean, today, uh, you know, um, I was notified about a property, so I'm going to have a look at it tomorrow. Last week, I looked at a couple of properties and, um, you know, I didn't get them, but who knows? It's OK. You know, there's going to be some other deals, but I'm definitely looking. And I think now I can sort of be a bit more uh, selective on what I'm buying. I got calls today from wholesalers asking me to do a deal. And uh, I, as I you know, ran through the analysis, I realized it didn't make any sense. So I kind of turned it down. So we do have the fortunate situation that we do or we can plan uh, and don't just have to uh, hastily uh, make decisions to purchase. So take your time and within reason, of course, and uh, plan accordingly. And then if it makes sense, pull the trigger. But obviously, I'm assuming that you have your financing in place. So not pl proper planning is one of the most common mistakes that a lot of people have. The second one is uh, failing to build a sound investment team. Failing to build a sound investment team. You know, we all know that, you know, uh, real estate investing is not something that you can do solo. Well, you probably can, 
but I wouldn't advise it. I tried that. It doesn't work. It's just too much stress. You know, the quote unquote lone wolf, uh, the guy or girl who just, you know, tries to do everything themselves, you know, because they feel that uh, they're the best to do everything. You know, in my experience, um, you know, having gone down that road, it really does take a group of professionals uh, to navigate the complex world of real estate investing. You know, you got lots of different skill sets involved. You got uh, you need the, uh, you know, I think the counsel and the assistance of people like real estate agents, uh, wholesalers, brokers, contractors, uh, inspectors, lend mortgage lenders, attorneys. There's a lot of people that, uh, you know, that sort of play a role in this. And it's important that you start building your team. Now, obviously, if you're in the D.C. area and we try to do something together, then you can leverage on my team. Uh, a team which I've developed over the past 35 years. But if you don't have a team, now is the time to start pulling the pieces together. You can go to a REA meeting, uh, speak to other people and uh, get references, get recommendations, um, you know, go to Bigger Pockets and uh, some of these other websites where you can kind of post on their forums. And, uh, and that way you may start the process of building your team. It does take time. But the sooner you can start, the better it is for you. If you can't leverage on somebody else's team, then you have to build your own. But you don't want to start from ground zero. You want to sort of, uh, you know, go some trusted sources and so on. So you need all these people because, uh, you know, they're all, well, hopefully they are anyway, they're all experts in their respective uh, areas of uh, study or fields. And, uh, you know, you need them in order to sort of make a successful, complete a successful uh, real estate deal. So, um, you know, so that's the important thing. If you're planning on rehabbing or renting properties, then also you'll need uh, other members of your team to make it uh, a reality, like painters, uh, electricians, plumbers, uh, roofers, flooring installers, cleaning services, HVAC technicians, lawn maintenance people. I mean, these are all people, general handymen. These are all people that you'll need to plug in at some point during the process. So if you're seriously, if you're serious about getting into real estate investing, you're not going to have the time to do the rehab and the repair yourself. I don't do it myself. I am lousy at drywall. I am lousy at painting. And uh, I'd rather have other people do it for me. So take the time to start building your team. That's number two. Okay. The other mistake is number three is not learning enough about real estate investing. Not learning enough, okay? Real estate investing is complicated, as I said earlier on. I'm still learning after 35 years. I still listen to, um, in fact, I was listening to a, a podcast. This, As you know, I, I, I'm i into, pod, I love podcasts. Uh, I was having my work, work out today. Uh, what's the guy? Uh, he calls himself the, um, uh, well, listen, what's his name again? Uh, it's a good guy. He's out in California. And he has a podcast which uh, uh, which I listen to on a regular basis. And he calls himself, as I will look back and get his name. You may want to check that out. Uh, he calls himself the real it, the, the podcast called Real Estate Realities. And he calls himself the Rebel Broker, the Rebel Broker. Uh, this guy called Robert Whit Whitelaw. Uh, he's out in California. I think he's in the Bay Area. He's pretty easy. He's very good. Um, and, uh, you know, he has a lot of uh, sage advice. Uh, he's kind of into data and uh, market trends. And uh, he kind of gives his perspective, having been in this business for uh, 20, 30 years that he's been doing. So uh, I listen to a lot and I'm always learning. I learned a lot today from this one of the podcasts that he had. Uh, he had a guest in there and, um, you know, and uh, he was sharing some wisdom based on ups and downs from uh, his experiences. So not learning enough about real estate investing is a mistake, a fatal mistake that a lot of people have. It's complicated and uh, there are lots of rules. There are a lot of laws. There's regulations that you have to comply with. You know, if you don't do your homework sufficiently, you could be stepping on a landmine, you know, and uh, it'll take it could take you uh, many years to get out of it you know, and, uh, and so on. So, you know, you do need to master, uh, you know, uh, concepts of real estate. I'm not saying you need to be a guru before you, um, uh, you know, pull the trigger, 
but I think you have to take an attitude that you don't know it all and uh, you got to learn yourself, take time to learn yourself or surround yourself with people who are more knowledgeable than you are. And therefore, hopefully you can gain the wisdom uh, that they have. So as I said before, hopefully you can avoid making what I call unnecessary mistakes. So you should definitely do your homework now before you spend money so that you can make smart decisions that will likely increase the chances of your success. So that's number three, not learning enough. The fourth mistake that a lot of investors make is um, not understanding the local real estate market that they're in. Okay, we all know the adage, all real estate is local. Location, location, location. You know, as a real estate investor, you do need to understand what's going on in your market, the values of properties, the inventory levels, the absorption rate, uh, home values, the average days on market uh, of properties. You do need to know all those things because that will help you, um, you know, decide what to offer. If it's a good deal or a bad deal, it'll help you um, establish your criteria for your uh, properties. And, uh, and hopefully, if you have your criteria, then you can avoid wasting a lot of time. Uh, as I said before, I got a call today from a wholesaler and he, he shared with me a potential deal. And I, you know, straight away, I just said it didn't meet my criteria. We just sort of stopped it from then. So all of these data points uh, help determine whether it will be prudent for you to move forward to purchase a particular property. So take the time to understand what's going on in your local market, <clears throat> uh, you know, or the areas that you are thinking of investing. Okay, so that's number four. Uh, number five uh, is uh, not understanding cash flow. Not understanding cash flow. You know, you know, I'm into the buy and hold model, and uh, you know, all my deals, uh, I'm looking for positive cash flow, and uh, and I'm looking for appreciation. I want both. And uh, as you know, I do the Section Eight strategy. Uh, which really, really, really is a godsend during a market slowdown. We're going to go through some pretty turbulent waters in the next few months or years. And trust me, I haven't gone through these cycles several times. The last thing you need are vacancies. The last things that you need are uh, tenants that don't want to pay you or tenants that can't pay you because of they lost their jobs or the economy is bad or whatever it is. You don't want to hear it. It's horrible. And, uh, and that's one of the blessings of the Section 8 program is that if you have good tenants, they're more likely to stay with you. And uh, most of the rent is guaranteed by the federal government. And therefore, your income stream is a lot more reliable and, than others. And that really makes a big, huge difference during the market slowdown. And I think a lot of people are going to realize that uh, in the next uh, few months or years, uh, how important it is to have... Uh, a stable income stream. Anyway, not understanding cash flow is, what, is a mistake that a lot of people have. Obviously, one of the significant challenges in owning real estate properties, rental properties, is maintaining enough cash flow to keep up with maintenance, repairs, and other um, costs or expenses that you incur in owning a property. A rental property is going to require maintenance. It, it is what it is. Um, you know, um, in fact, one of my properties. Today, we, we, we're doing some, uh, we're replacing the roof on one, a property which I've owned for a, a, a quite a few years. And uh, it's had a lot of deferred maintenance. And, uh, and so I just decided to bite the bullet and replace the roof. So the contractor are replacing the roof on one of the houses. I'm doing a little upgrade into that property. Uh, it's in Montgomery County, in Tacoma Park. And uh, it's appreciated quite a bit since I bought it. So I'm okay with, uh, and also the tenant's been there for, Oh my goodness, at least seven years. So during that time, the property is really appreciating value. So I wanted to sink a little bit of money into it and replace the roof because I did have some um, uh, problems there. So, you know, you've got to have enough, you gotta, you got to have the reserves to do that. And uh, you've got to have the, the team to allow you to take care of these emergencies. I think I shared with you last week uh, during the, um, the really cold spell uh during the christmas time i had three burst pipes three burst pipes on my different properties so these things happen you know 
Uh, but, you know, I was able to get over it. We had the team in place and we got the job done. So, you know, you got to have understand you got to have enough reserves through cash flow to be able to take these incidentals when they occur, because they will occur. And uh, so, you know, especially if you're going to have multiple properties, you got to have, make sure that you have enough in there just in case several issues hit you at one time. So if you, you, know, you may say, well, I'm just going to give it to a management company. Let them deal with it. I don't have time for this. Uh, well, that could be well, true. But management company is going to take maybe 8, 9, 10, 11, 12% of your uh, rental income uh as their commissions and that may be okay but you got to make sure you have enough buffer to be able to um you know uh, uh you know allow for them taking that percentage away from your rent, uh, rental income uh the other thing is uh on cash flow is make sure you understand the concept of vacancies uh vacancies and turnovers as you all know uh vacancies and turnovers are the i call them the killers the silent killers uh to your cash flow it, it's so 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 expensive to have a turnover there's no money coming in you got you got to paint the house you got to clean the house you got to advertise the house you got to look for new tenants you got to screen tenants you got oh, it's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on in the meantime you have no money coming in so it can get very expensive and that's the reason why i spend so much effort on minimizing turnover that's the reason why i do what i do uh attention to customer service making sure that the tenants, uh, you know, uh, know that I appreciate them because there's a positive uh, bottom line savings by minimizing turnover and, and, uh, and vacancies. So it's really important to understand the concept of cash flow and, uh, and how your property is going to be able to generate the income to support itself and take care of the incidentals if and when they come. So the, obviously there are soft costs, uh, you know, like the mortgage, the taxes, the insurance, but there's also a lot of hidden miscellaneous costs uh, associated with owning real estate. So again, the whole idea is the cash flow concept is going to help you. A lot of people don't understand it, you know, and hopefully that's one of the mistakes that a lot of people make. And that's the reason why I think you need to be aware of that. Okay, so let's kind of do a quick... Uh, uh summary we're about halfway through so number one is mistake is not planning carefully jumping in uh without a plan just sort of buying stuff without systems in place just sort of getting uh caught up with the rah-rah and the hoopla especially during the previous few months when we had a seller's market number two mistake is failing to buy uh to build a sound investment team trying to do yourself, trying to be a lone wolf, trying to be a lone ranger. Uh, you can't do it all yourself. It's not worth it. it. You'll run yourself ragged. Been there, done that. It doesn't make it happen. Assemble a good team, uh, real estate agents, financial uh, people, um, contractors, property managers. Assemble your team. If you can't do it, leverage on somebody else's team. Number three mistake is not learning enough about real estate. You don't need to be a guru to get involved in real estate to start off with. But you do need to have some knowledge. And the more knowledge you have, the better. I don't want you going to the point whereby you feel, what does it say, an, a paralysis analysis or analysis paralysis. No, I'm not saying that that one. But there comes a point whereby you do need to know something, but you don't need to sort of master everything. Uh, taking the time to learn. Uh, always be in a learning mode. I'm always in a learning mode, uh, even though I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, the number four uh, mistake is not understanding the local market. Uh, you know, they don't know the dynamics about ARV after repair values, uh, don't know what's going on, what's trending uh, in the market. They may not know uh, values for renovations. They may not know values for, um, you know, days on market and other metrics like that. Understand your local market, especially places where you intend to invest, whether it be on a macro level a state level, uh, a city level, or a neighborhood level. Know your market. Um, and number five is not understanding the, the concept of cash flow. Cash flow is the lifeblood of your business. Uh, you need to be able to manage that. And the more you understand about cash flow, the better it is for you. Uh, I've learned that the biggest cash flow killer is vacancy and turnover. 
And that's the reason why I do what I do in terms of trying to minimize turnover and vacancies because it's a silent killer to your cash flow. So that's where we are halfway through. Let's get to number six. Let's say, oh, what's time? 725. So, so again, put your questions together in the chat box. I'm going to get to them very shortly. And uh, let's see if you got some good questions for me today. And I'm looking forward to hearing from you and uh, having some dialogue today. So let's go. Number six is not having multiple exit strategies. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, you know, you're buying a house. You probably know what your plan A is, what, what you're going to do, which is fine, which you should know. Uh, but do you have a plan B or plan C just in case plan A doesn't pan out? OK, uh, it doesn't always work out. Believe me, you may be having a goal of uh, of selling, flipping this house. And then for whatever reason, the market turns on you, you can't sell. So now what are you going to do? You got to make sure you have a plan B and make sure that, uh, you know, you can implement plan B just in case plan A doesn't work out. A lot of people are going to fall into this trap. Uh, you know, as the market turns, as the market shifts, because they went in uh, with uh, a game plan in mind, and uh, and now they may not be able to sell it. For example, and uh, they can't reduce the price because they paid top dollar during the heyday, and so they can't rent it and get positive cash flow because they paid too much, and uh, so they're now kind of stuck. So I know for me. Uh, when I buy houses, especially during slow times like we're, in, we're entering, to, I always make sure that there are at least two exit strategies are possible. Uh, you know, if I um, my main goal is to buy and hold, so I'm want to make sure that I can get cash flow, but I also make sure there's enough equity there whereby if I need to sell, then I can sell. That's the reason why I don't do these turnkey stuff because the turnkey model it sounds good in theory but the problem is that you're paying top dollar uh because the the turnkey provider has sucked all the equity out and so he's selling or she's selling you the house at market value now you have no equity so if something happens and you need to offload and many times these turnkey uh purchases are out of state uh so you're not close to uh it's not close to where you live and uh the projections that they tell you may not always materialize and now it's kind of too late and uh you know you don't have the exit strategies to be able to support you and therefore you're stuck okay so make sure you have multiple exit strategies uh just in case plan a doesn't work out um and it may not work out but it is what it is but it's better to be um ready proactive rather than reactive and try and scurry around later on so number seven is uh Assuming that real estate investing will make you wealthy quickly. Assuming that real estate investing will make you quick, uh, quickly build wealth, you know, get rich quick. Uh, it, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. You know, uh, for real estate, at least if you do the buy and hold model, it's a get rich slowly type thing. And uh, if you have a five or 10 year projection, uh, you can do very well. You can just buy one a year, and uh, and you can do very well in ten years from now, and uh, and so on. So it's not one of those things where I know the gurus tell you all you gotta do is buy my course and somehow miracles will occur. It doesn't work that way. It takes time. You got to have a long term uh, projection, projection, and uh, the real money, the real wealth builder, is through appreciation. That's the reason why is you have to be careful where you buy. And what you buy, uh, because it'll take time uh, for you to to generate the, the the wealth and the financial independence that we that you are striving for, that we all are striving for. It just doesn't happen overnight. Okay, you're not going to quit your job tomorrow. Uh, it doesn't work that way. And I will strongly advise you not to quit your job unless you are ready. And all the pieces are in place. Okay, so it's a wealth building, long-term wealth building strategy, uh, in spite of whatever it is that you've heard from the flipping infomercials. And uh, I'm, I'm not saying that you can't get lucky 
from flipping houses and get big profits. I'm not saying that you can't do that. I'm just saying that, especially during this type of market that we're in, it's very difficult. It's not impossible, but it's not easy. Uh, so therefore, you need to set your expectations a lot more realistically. Okay, you need to have more realistic expectations. Uh, you're probably going to spend quite a bit of time, quite a bit of money, um, you know, before you see the significant returns. The first house I bought uh, many, many years ago, I was making $50 in cash flow, $50 after all was said and done. And I had tenants from hell. And all I was getting was 50 bucks. Fast forward today, the house is worth, well, not the house is worth, the house is renting for $4,700 plus dollars, and there's no mortgage on that house. So it takes time, and this is plus 30 years, okay? And, uh, but uh, take a lot, I'm not saying you should wait 30 years, uh, I'm just saying that uh, it's not going to happen tomorrow, okay? So that's number seven, is taking, be more realistic of your expectations for real estate. Number eight is spending too much, uh, this is number eight mistake that a lot of investors do, is spending too much money or too much on an investment, spending too much, paying too much, okay? Uh, whereby they don't actually uh, make a profit, okay? Uh, they probably pay too much on the front end. Uh, again, this is probably more realistic uh, during the heyday uh, a few months ago, a year ago, when everybody, every Tom, Dick, and Harry was buying houses, they just, you know, you had to get into these bidding wars where you had to pay a lot more than you really wanted to. Those days, for the most part, are definitely, uh, you know, are reducing. There are bidding wars, but not to the same level that we were uh, many months ago. So whatever happens to your market, it may or may not be in your favor. The price you pay for your house is very, very important. So be careful what you pay. All the hard work in the world won't change the fact that you overpay for a house. Okay. Uh, yes, it's going to, over time, you'll forget that you paid a little bit more. It may be okay. But in the short term, if you need to offload and you overpaid, you can have yourself in a little bit of prob uh, problem. So before you buy a property, consult with the right professionals, uh, like your real estate agent, and do as much research as you can, uh, you know, such that way you are confident and uh, in your decision even with all the research that you may uh, you know do you may end up paying too much so be careful uh but it's less likely to you're less likely to pay too much if uh if you take the time to learn your market and you do the right thing so number nine mistake that a lot of investors do again i hope uh, this is enjoyable hope this is interesting we're going to get down to q a very shortly so put your questions together um, so I'm going to try to answer as many as I can today before I close shop for tonight and go and relax and chill out and maybe watch some Netflix, uh, uh, you know, yeah, maybe I'll watch a Netflix, uh, movie tonight. Uh, okay. Anyway, so number nine is uh, failing to do your, your own due diligence. Uh, there is typically a feeling that, um, you know, uh, you got, you know, times of the essence, you got to move fast. Uh, yes, you do, uh, because the good deals tend to go very fast, but you do need to do your own due diligence. Okay. And, uh, to make sure that what you, you're moving into this thing with your eyes open. Okay. And, uh, it's really important you do your due diligence. Uh, and what does due diligence mean? It means understanding the market, the condition of the property, your exit strategy, uh, what the repair cost is going to be, how much work needs to be done. All those things is part of your due diligence. Maybe getting a home inspector in there, uh, you know, to kind of gauge what repairs are necessary and things like that. So you absolutely must do your due diligence before you pull the trigger. Otherwise, you could end up purchasing something that will suck away all the money that you have. It becomes what we call an alligator. Eats up all your money. I've had those things. Uh, all you're doing is just a one directional flow of funds out of your pocket into the property. It just like it never ends. It never ends. It never ends. It never. It just keeps on going. And at some point, you sort of get tired of it. You get frustrated and you start questioning yourself. And you start saying, well, why did I buy this? Why me? Why me? You know, uh, if only, you know, but at that point, it's too late. 
Okay, so take your time to do your due diligence. Uh, you go in there with your eyes open. And uh, another one would be as part of due diligence. I try to do is to go to properties, um, you know, especially during the summer, like on the weekends, to kind of see, you know, uh, the neighborhood at nighttime. And uh, because sometimes when you go there during the day, nothing's going on. But when you come at nighttime, the whole another world that's taking place there. So that's part of my due diligence sometimes is to go to the house or go to the neighborhood, drive around, cruise around at different times of the evenings to see what it's like. Uh, because nothing worse. I've been there as well. You got a great house. You rehabbed it. It's looking beautiful. You put it out to rent and your neighbor uh, are just a bunch of hoodlums and gangsters and you know, and, 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 and dramas, you know, and, and therefore people are coming to look at your house and they're confronted with drama in the neighborhood. Uh, so it doesn't matter what you've done in your house. People aren't going to stop. They're going to keep on going. Uh, I've been there, done that. It is, but at that point it's too late. Okay. So research is always important. Uh, and it's an integral part of your buying decision. So don't, um, what's it called? Uh, slow down or don't so sort of mitigate or, or reduce or minimize uh, your due diligence because it's really important. You don't want to find out after the fact that, oh my gosh, I, I wish I never bought this house. It's too late. Number 10 is uh, buying in the wrong area. Oh, buying in the wrong area. One of the biggest mistakes a lot of investors have is just buying in the wrong area. They buy a house and later on they regret buying it uh, for whatever reason. Uh, this goes to the old premise, all real estate is local, uh, which I mentioned earlier on. Uh, there are always going to be some cities, some neighborhoods that are on the up, and there are always going to be some cities, states that's on the down. Okay. Uh, so understand where you are buying, what you are buying, who your likely customers are going to be, whether it be on the sales side or on the rental side. Do they want to live there? What kind of people can you attract? Uh, what's the crime level? What's the quality of the schools? What's the highway access? What's the amenities? Shopping, recreation, transportation. Uh, you know, these are things that uh, <coughs> are important. It's part of your due diligence and it help you avoid buying the wrong area. Okay. It may, in theory, sound like a good deal, but in reality, it's not. There's reasons why some areas are cheap. Uh, and there's reasons why some areas are a little bit more expensive. Okay. And uh, so you buy the best that you can with what you have. Uh, an exceptional real estate agent, well, I think if you're new to the area, will be able to advise you uh, and hopefully help you make the right decision. And then finally, there's a little bonus I'm throwing in there, making the wrong improvements, making the wrong improvements. That's another mistake that a lot of uh, uh, investors have. They spend the money on the wrong things, okay? When fixing the house, they over improve. Um, in fact, uh, you know, if you're rehabbing the house, if you're not careful, that can break the bank. It can really, really, uh, you know, run your pockets dry. OK, you got to make a lot of decisions. Where do you put the money? Should I spend the money on this versus that? That's, I having that conversation uh, with Amber. This uh, she's a real estate investor uh, earlier this week because she's buying a the house. Uh, there's only so much money that you have when you're rehabbing the house. Uh, you know, you, uh, you've got to spend your money wisely and, uh, and make sure you don't, you know, because if you spend your money on A, it means there's less money for B uh, or there's no money for C. Okay. And therefore, what will the customer, the end customer, whether it be a buyer or a, uh, a tenant, what would they appreciate? Okay. Uh, you know, my experience is that a lot of people appreciate kitchen and bathrooms. So if you got some extra money, that's where I would spend it. Uh, not necessarily on buying high-end pipes or electrical wire, uh, you know, things like that. So, um, you know, be careful, uh, you know, when you're doing the rehab, how you allocate your resources, your money. And uh, because certain improvements do give you a better return than other improvements and, uh, you know, and so on. So be cognizant of that, the color schemes that you, you decide to paint with, the flooring, uh, the type of kitchen fixtures, all these things are important. And so what improvements you make uh, on the interior and the exterior could make a huge difference in terms of your ability to rent 
or to sell the property. So in finally, uh, final thoughts here. So what I've shared with you today, um, you know, are some of the common mistakes that uh, real estate investors make. And uh, based on experience, I made a lot of these mistakes. Uh, I'm still make mistakes. I'm not perfect. Uh, I still make mistakes, but uh, I make a lot fewer mistakes than I used to make. And hopefully by sharing with you today, I can give you some cues, some ideas on when you do your deals, hopefully you can avoid making some of these mistakes and so on. So let me just quickly run through one more time the top 10 mistakes or 11 mistakes. Uh, number one, not planning carefully. Number two, failing to build a sound investment team. Number three is not learning enough about real estate investing before you start. Number four is not understanding the local real estate market where you're buying. Number five is uh, not understanding the concept of cash flow. Number six is uh, uh, not having multiple exit strategies. Uh, they just focus on put all their eggs in one exit strategy and then find out that that number one or that, uh, you know, plan A is just not working out because of the market shift. Number seven, assuming that uh, real estate investing will make you uh, wealthy quickly. It's all about get rich quick. It doesn't work that way. It's a time. Time is important. You want time to be your friend. It's a get rich slowly. Uh, spending too much on an investment, uh, overpaying for a house at the beginning. Uh, number nine is failing to do your due diligence. And uh, number 10 is buying in the wrong area. And the bonus uh, is making the wrong improvements. So that's what we uh, talked about today. Hopefully it was helpful. And uh, so we're going to go Q&A in a second. So uh, let's have a look. So again, if you want to shoot me an email, I can reach that joe at joeasamo.com. And uh, as I said, I'm getting ready to start getting back into buying. Uh, the market's slow, which means that there's going to be some good opportunities to buy. If you feel the same way, let me know if I can be of assistance to you. Uh, I'm going to focus uh, most of the next uh, few months on those people who are buying. Uh, who are ready to pull the trigger, the people who, um, you know, want to take advantage of some of this, uh, what do I call it, the window of opportunity that's going to exist. So uh, if that's you, uh, if I can, if you feel I can be of assistance, that can, you can leverage my, my network, my relationships, my systems, my tools, then let's talk and, uh, and so on. So we're going to kind of go to Q&A and so put your questions in the chat box and let's get busy. Let's have a look. What we have here today. Number one, Alejandros. Hi, Dr. Joe. I'm starting the process to rent out a couple of properties in D.C. I would love your advice on this topic. Oh, my goodness. Let's have a look. Uh, what? Okay. Let's have a look what questions you have, Alejandro. Uh, would I add an extra layer of protection if I apply as a business entity for the basic business license required in D.C. instead of applying as a sole proprietor? Good question, Alejandro. Um, yeah, I mean, in D.C., for those people who aren't familiar, if you're in Washington, uh, D.C., or most states now, they expect you to be licensed if you own um, uh, rental properties. So uh, the city or the county or the state uh, has some kind of licensing thing. In Washington, D.C., they require that you have a basic business license. Uh, some parts of uh, Maryland, they expect you to have a uh, a landlord license and uh you know and so you have to be licensed uh correctly and uh so in washington dc you need what we call a basic business license you apply online and uh you know you fill up a bunch of forms out and then you submit your money and uh, ultimately if it's a single family or a multi-family there's an inspection that takes place and uh, and so forth and so on. So the question Alejandro has is, uh, you know, does he need to be in a business entity or can he do it as a sole proprietor? It really doesn't, it doesn't matter. You can do either. It depends on your situation. When I first started, I, I purchased properties in my personal name. My, I was a sole proprietor and I was okay. Uh, you know, people do it. It was cheaper to get financing. Uh, it was simple. And, uh, you know, I was able to get loans at discounted rates, uh, residential rates, and uh, because I was buying it in my personal name. Now, there is a downside, obviously, in terms of liability protection, uh, but it's not essential. It's not required 
that you uh, establish a, an entity, whether it be an LLC, to do business. Uh, so it's up to you. I mean, I now buy all my properties in LLCs, in entities. Uh, all my business, basic business license are in entities. So, it, you know, I mean, that's where I am now. But if that's where you're starting, you start where you, you know, I just don't want people to use that as an excuse not to, not to pull the trigger. That's what bothers me is, uh, you know, I'm not going to buy a house until I have all my asset protection systems in place. No, no, no. Buy a house. Uh, you know, what's the point? In Let's get some assets to protect. How about that? Uh, first. And then we'll, you know, and, you know, rather than having some convoluted, sophisticated asset protection strategy, but you have no assets. So, um, you know, let's, let's, let, you know, whichever what makes sense for you, Alejandro. Uh, but the important thing is that I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, happy for you that you've decided to go ahead and, uh, you know, buy your next property. And uh, again, if I can be of assistance to you uh, on your journey, uh, let me know and I'll see what I can do. Okay. Okay. Uh, CJ Williams. Hey, Dr. Joe, do you have any issues? You have issues with possible tenants being able to afford the large deposit on properties since Section 8 doesn't cover it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it is what it is. So, um, you know, I mean, the rents where we I'm paying, I have typically four, five, and six bedroom houses. I just, I rented one a few uh, months ago. Uh, the rent there was $4,753. Okay, that's the rent. And the security deposit is $4,763, one month's rent. So this I rented to a Section 8 voucher holder, uh, Housing Choice Voucher Program. Great tenant, uh, Tier 1 tenant, loves the home. I, you know, uh, did a very, very thorough screen. I went to her home, see how she keeps the place, checked her references out. I did all the usual stuff. And, uh, but she has to come up with $4,753, okay, security deposit. Uh, you know, I mean, in Washington, D.C., in Maryland, there are programs out here. There are organizations out here that assist, uh, you know, with security deposit. Uh, Washington has a thing called ERAP, uh, Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Uh, they uh, assist you with uh, security deposit. You have to apply. It's a process. It's not something that happens in a day. Also, you can establish a payment plan with your tenant. So that way you pay the security deposit over a period of time. But what I don't recommend you do is to waive your security deposit requirements or to reduce them. It's always one month's rent as far as I'm concerned. And not everybody can come up with that money. But what I found is that if they want that house, if they love that house, they'll figure a way and uh, at least get most of it and then maybe you can set up a payment plan for the for, for the delta so yes it is an issue uh but that's the reason why i have great houses and great areas because uh these tenants love my home and they'll figure it out and my assistant uh we have uh we're always researching what organizations are out there that can assist tenants with security deposit rent uh, utilities and so on so good question there uh cj uh Sasina uh, Degefu, uh, thank you for your live sessions. Would you invest outside of the DC area? It depends. Uh, there are great places to invest. Uh, you know, I don't know which area you're in. I uh, uh, hope I pronounced it right, Sasina. Uh, you know, I just, I'm a, I live in this DC area, so I tend to invest here. I don't buy too far away uh, because I know this market. Uh, but would I invest outside of this DC area? Possibly. Um, but it just depends on the, the, the circumstances and so on. So it's a possibility. But right now, all my properties are within, I don't know, uh, 20 minutes from my house. And, uh, you know, that's just how I did it. So hopefully that was. But again, that's just me. And everyone uh, could be different. As they say, each to their own. Okay, next question. Very helpful. Thank you. Oh, you're from Atlanta, CJ. Yeah, so as I said, uh, uh, you know, you can buy. People will figure a way to uh, to come up with a security deposit. They will. And uh, otherwise, you just have to work with them. But take the time to invest or to learn organizations that can assist. So it's a partnership between you and your tenant. And uh, I know not all my tenants can come up with 
three, four, five, six thousand dollars security deposit. They can't. So I have to figure a way to help them come up with that money. And there are organizations, there are processes that you can do to help you with that. Okay. Lewis M. How do you go about assembling a good team? Again, if you got some questions, feel free to post it <coughs> uh, during this q and got a couple more minutes left before I wrap it up for the day. Uh, how do you go about assembling a good team? Uh, that's a good question, uh, Lewis. Uh, there's different ways. If uh, Let's say I moved into town and I didn't know anybody. Okay, so that's uh, I'm at ground zero. What I would do would be uh, a couple of things. One, I will do some research finding the uh, local REAs in the area. Um, you know, these are real, real estate investor associations, and there's probably some in um, you know that exists wherever you are. I would find out where these places are. I would uh, go attend the meetings if they're local, uh, if they're in person, or attend if they're virtual. Uh, there's usually a leader or a head person of that uh, RIA. I will get to know that person, and uh, they will know who the uh, the players are in your area, whether it be uh, the flippers, the uh, the rehabbers, the uh, uh, buy and hold guys, the investor. They they know all those players, and you can explain to them what you're trying to do. And uh, you know if they know that you're serious. And you know what you're doing. They may refer you, oh, go and speak to so-and-so. He's pretty good. Or go and speak to that person. He's pretty good. Or here's a contact person and so on. Okay, so that's number one thing you can do. Uh, the other thing would be to do is to do some research. If you don't have any rears that you know of, uh, go to like Bigger Pockets and some of these sort of real estate forums. And you can post there. And uh, people may come up with some referrals. Another thing you could do is to go to the local big box store like a... Uh, uh home depot lowe's go to the pro desk they probably know people uh you know who are good at their trade if you're looking for contractors uh that's a good way um what are the good ways you can think of it's just referrals you know go to people like myself uh or find other seasoned investors who are trying to do what it is that you're doing and ask them uh who they recommend they may be able to help you with some referrals as well so it's there are ways um but uh you know leverage on other people's relationships uh it's a lot quicker than you trying to create those relationships yourself so that's uh how i would go about assembling a team uh okay so Cena again how much insurance again if you got some questions uh feel free to uh you know put it in the chat box i'm gonna try and get to you it's, i know we're probably gonna wrap it up in a couple of minutes um uh, you know, but if you got one, I may take one more. Otherwise, I'm just going to wrap it up for today. Uh, I want to watch my uh, Netflix movie here. So how much insurance do you recommend as a landlord? Do you have umbrella insurance? Good question. Uh, how much insurance you... Uh, well, first of all, it depends if you have a mortgage. If you have a mortgage, then a the mortgage company is going to require you to have insurance. The mortgage company is going to tell you how much insurance uh, they are going to request from you. OK, so they're going to tell you we need this minimum amount of insurance. We need this amount of liability, uh, you know, and uh, it's going to have these things. So uh, so and you also want to make sure you have the right insurance. So if you're a landlord, you want to make sure you got a landlord insurance. Uh, you don't want a homeowner's insurance uh, because that's the wrong policy type. And so make sure you got the right insurance. Make sure you have a landlord policy, which has uh, certain riders like uh, fire. Uh, you got things like loss of rent. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of different things. I'm not an insurance agent. I just got a lot of insurance policies. And uh, so there's a lot of good people out there uh, in terms of, uh, you know, who can get advice. But again, the, the, the mortgage company, if you have a mortgage, is going to require that you have at least enough coverage to take care of the debt and uh and the rebuilding of the property should there be uh you know any kind of uh uh major loss uh do i have in umbrella insurance yes i do uh umbrella insurance it kind of overrides all the different sub policies so you may have insurance for property number one insurance for property number two insurance for property number three all the way to insurance for property n and uh each of those uh, will have their own separate insurance policies and uh, the umbrella overrides all that. 
So in the event that uh, you don't have enough coverage uh, from a loss uh, from the underlying policy, then the over the umbrella policy kicks in. So for example, let's keep it simple. If you have a, uh, a property insurance, so let's say $500,000, that's how much coverage you have on the property. And there's some kind of loss and the uh, the person that's uh, you know tenant or the person that's suing you sues you for six hundred thousand, and they're successful. Well, your policy only covers five hundred thousand, which means that technically you're exposed for the other hundred. So that's where the uh, the umbrella policy comes in. It kicks in, overrides that, uh, you know, so that way you have something that's shielding you in the event. It's like excess insurance. Uh, in, in the event that the underlying insurance uh, doesn't cover you. And you can pay up to different amounts, maybe a million, two million, three million, four million, five. So, you know, you pay obviously um, uh, to get as much coverage as you think is relevant. If you're just starting out, you may not need a lot of insurance, uh, umbrella insurance, because you don't have that much assets. But if you've been around for a long time, like I, do, I have, then I may need more uh, coverage than maybe you do. So again, it just depends on your individual situation. I would suggest that you speak to an insurance agent. Uh, there's lots of them out there who can better advise you uh, on uh, you know, what's your sort of the insurance strategy that you may want to pursue and so on. Good question though. Uh, let's have a look. Next one. I'm in New York City looking to retire and grow my real estate business. Great. Uh, looking to diversify my portfolio and add Section 8 single family homes. Looking to work in my Ethiopia, looking to work in my Ethiopian community in the DC area. Okay, good for you. So, uh, so Sunny, I hope I pronounce it right. So, Sunny, uh, there's a lot of Ethiopians. I know they got, there's a pretty large Ethiopian community in Washington, DC. <clears throat> I think it's one of the largest in the US. Uh, and if I was going to go to Ghana at Christmas, uh, Ethiopia Airlines flies from Washington, DC to not to Ghana, but I think we go to uh, what's that? uh next a neighboring country i think it's i don't know whatever it is and uh but uh, united airlines flies direct to a cry in ghana so uh but i'll be going to ghana as a you know in uh february next month anyway so uh so great it's like you're looking to um you're in dc but looking to uh look into the dc area again if you're looking to buy uh you can reach out to me if i can help you i'll be more than happy to to help you on your journey. It's a, uh, the DC area is, is good. It's a stable real estate market. Um, you know, prices uh, do go up for the most part because the economy is pretty strong here. And yeah, Togo, there you go. Uh, yeah, they, they fly directly to Togo. And uh, and then from Togo, they go to uh, Addis, 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 anyway, I always call it Addis. Uh, the capital of uh, Ethiopia. I haven't been to Ethiopia yet, but uh, my goal this year is to go to at least three countries. I'll be going to Ghana next month. Uh, I'll be going to uh, Mexico uh, for a destination wedding in, um, uh, I think it's July, I think, June or July. Uh, a real estate investor friend of mine is getting married, so they invited me to, to attend the wedding. And uh, I will be going to, I think I'll be going to Uganda uh later on in the year and uh, while we're there we're probably going to go to uganda and kenya and possibly tanzania as well uh so that's my that's that's what's on the schedule i've been invited to go to uh uh let's have a little i've invited so far other place i've been invited this year is uh, guatemala i've been invited there for this year i've also been invited to korea um so yeah uh dr joe's uh international it's all good i'm looking forward to it. it's gonna be a wonderful year and uh, hopefully if i can assist you on your journey i will definitely try to do so anyway it is now about eight o'clock so i'm gonna wrap it up for the day we're asking great question hopefully today was helpful and i will see you next wednesday same time have yourself a wonderful evening take care bye for now